Hello, Halfway students and families. This is Mrs. Kobercheck again, reading Chapter 20 of Cryptid Hunters, The Sky House. Bo ambled over to the perplexed Marty, still sporting the baseball cap. That's my cap! Marty made a grab for it, but Bo dodged and ran away. Where are you going? Where's Grace? Without looking back, Bo disappeared into the foliage. Marty followed and found Grace's footprints the freshly cut vines, and the opening. Grace? No answer. PD? No yap. He jogged back to the pack, found one of Wolf's headlamps, and slipped the elastic band over his forehead. Halfway through the opening, he got stuck, but managed to wiggle free. On the other side, there was no sign of Grace or the poodle. Something grabbed his legs from behind. Bo's joke didn't have nearly the impact on Marty, as it had on Grace. You moron! Marty made another lunge for the cat, but missed again. Bo retreated up a tree. If you lose my hat, he threatened, you won't have a head to wear it on. Bo, he Bo hooted, and Marty started following the tracks, wishing his sister had not wandered off, and wondering what had it gotten into her lately. She had picked a very bad time to become independent, Walking without the heavy pack was a pleasure in spite of the rain, which was filtered down through the canopy by the warm bucket. Bucketful. He wished he had his cap. Within half an hour, the tracks were all washed away, and he began to wonder if he was still on the right trail. He stopped to look at the gizmo, but found it wasn't in his shirt pocket. The search of his other pockets came up empty as well. He had a vague reco recollection of it being slipped out of his pocket while he was sleeping. Grace, he thought, shaking his head. She doesn't even know how to use it. He trudged into the gloom for another half hour and was about to turn around when his headlamp caught the glint of the machete blade. He picked it up with a worried expression. For Grace to have gotten this far, she would have had to have been running. Running from what? And why had she dropped the machete? He started to he started to jog, arriving at the clearing 15 minutes later in a wind-driven downpour. A bright flash of lightning revealed his sister sitting out in the open next to a pond. He walked over to her. P.D. was sitting in her lap, shivering, looking a great deal like a drenched rat. Grace didn't look much better. Are you okay, Grace? Yes, of course, she answered calmly. Marty wasn't sure if he should be relieved or irritated. Did you forget something? Like what? Like me! He, cho <laughs> he chose irritated. I'm fine, by the way. A hungry croc didn't come out of the lake and drag me into the water while I was sleeping or anything, which I'm sure you were worried about. I'm sorry, Grace said without taking her eyes off the pond. Who is this girl and what has she done with my sister marty thought then said this is no place to be wandering around with a teacup poodle there are things out here that can kill you grace a lot of things his lecture was punctuated by a lightning strike that was close enough for them to hear the tree it hit crack and fall see what i mean the parrot led me here grace said what marty ears were ringing from the strike and he couldn't quite hear what she was she had said the parrot showed me the opening in the rock not the parrot again it's true grace insisted where's this magic parrot of yours now marty asked it left when the lightning started which is exactly what you should have done i thought about it but i was afraid i might get lost in the dark Marty glanced around the clearing. You don't call this being lost? Grace shook her head. I know this place. Now what are you talking about? I think this is one of the places in my nightmare. Well, it's like a nightmare, Marty commented. Have you noticed the rain, wind, thunder, and lightning? Duh, John Jor. Marty managed to smile. Perhaps this girl was his sister after all. We're going to be dead, de jour, if we don't get out of the rain and lightning, he said. The only good thing about this weather is that all the insects have drowned. 
Grace turned and pointed to a very large tree directly behind them. Good idea, Marty said. It will be a lot drier next to the trunk than it is out in the open. Grace shook her head. That's the tree the sky house is in. Marty looked up at the swaying branches and saw no sign of a tree house. How do you know that? I just do, Grace said. Check the gizmo. It'll tell us if we're in the right place. Okay, hand it over. I don't have it. Didn't you take it from my pocket when I was asleep? Gray shook her head. I could have sworn. Marty checked his pockets again, then grabbed their father's pack and rummaged through it. Maybe it's in the big pack, Gray suggested. Might be, Marty said. Unfortunately, I didn't bring the big pack. Why not? Because I didn't expect to be spending the night out here. Besides, it wouldn't have fit through the opening you found. I barely fit through myself. Oh well, Grace said, and walked over to the tree. It was drier, but not by much. Bo dropped out of another tree and joined her. Marty brought the small pack over and snatched his cap off Bo's head. Thanks. He wrung the cap out and put it on his head and pulled a small flashlight out of the pack and shined it up through the thick branches as he walked around the tree. When he got back to where Grace was standing, he said, I'll need a rope to reach the lowest branch. The rope is in the other pack. Here are our choices. We spend the night like a cup of, couple of salamanders or we hike back to the lake, crawl under one of the tarps and come back in the morning when it's light and hopefully a little drier. There's a third choice, Grace said. I'm not getting the other pack tonight and hiking back here, Marty protested. That isn't what I had in mind. Good, then I'm all ears. What's the third choice? The ladder, Grace said. What ladder? Grace took the flashlight from him and walked a couple trees over. This ladder. Marty and P.D. joined her, and the beam of the flashlight was an old aluminum ladder with years of undergrowth clinging to it as if it might try to escape. I think Wolf might have said something about the ladder, Marty in admitted. He didn't say anything to me about it, Grace said. I just knew it was here. Whatever. Marty freed the ladder with his machete, then dragged it over and started pushing the extension up along the trunk. Before he had it set, Bo scrambled up the rungs, grabbing Marty's hat on the way. Show off, Marty shouted as she disappeared through the low, lower branches. What do you think about climbing a metal ladder in the middle of a lightning storm? Grace asked. It's a bad idea, Marty said. He stuffed the drenched poodle into the pack and started to climb. Last one to the top is a rotten sour pot, sour pot egg. Climbing an al aluminum ladder in the middle of an electrical storm was not on Grace's list, but she was certainly going to add it if she lived through the experience. She climbed up after him. Marty balanced on the top rung of the ladder, groping the wet trunk for a handhold, hoping he didn't grab a snake or worse, a hairy spider the size of his head. Grace clung to the shaking ladder, wishing she had waited until the following morning to tell morning to tell Marty about the tree, which she was certain was going to be uprooted any second. Hey, Marty called down. There are metal handholds bolted to the tree. They're a little hard to see through and they're slippery. He clambered up, stopping every few feet to make sure Grace was still behind him. The higher he climbed, the more the tree swayed. He waited for Grace to catch up to him. Are you sure this is the right tree? He shouted above the roaring wind and thunderclaps. It has to be, Grace shouted back. Why else would it have metal handholds? I knew that. Marty continued his accent ascent, and 16 handholds later, he reached a small platform, but he was not the first to arrive. Bo was sitting in the corner, triumphantly holding Marty's cap above his head like a above her head like a victory trophy. Marty ignored her and pulled Grace up to the platform. Well, that was horrible, she said. We must be at least a hundred feet off the ground. That's not very comforting. Marty shined the headlamp above them and saw a trap door with a large padlock dangling from it. He shook his head in weary disgust. Lockbox, he said. What? I just remembered another thing Wolf said. There's a key taped at the bottom rung of the ladder. What else did he say? It'll come to me, Marty answered. Grace looked down below into the wet darkness. Marty sighed. 
I guess I'll have to go back down and get it, unless you can spring that lock. She took a close look at the padlock with the flashlight. She hadn't picked a lock in years, despite her brother's constant pleas for her to do so. It was a simple lock. She rubbed off the moss covering the key cylinder. Let me have your pocket knife. Marty fished it out and handed it to her. The knife had several tools, but she would still need a separate piece of wire to pick the tumbler. She asked Marty to look in the pack for something that would work. The very bottom of the pack, beneath PD, who Marty had set on the platform, the Frankenstein monkey, the camp stove, three packets of freeze-dried eggs, and the moleskin, he found the Mother's Day card. Attached to it with a paper clip was the drawing he had sketched for her. He hesitated to use the clip because it was one of the last things his mother had touched. Reluctantly, he removed it. Will this work? Grace nodded. She straightened the clip and slid it into the opening, then used one of the knife's several screwdrivers to turn the cylinder. The padlock opened with a satisfying pop. You're going to have to show me how to do that sometime, Marty said. Fat chance, Grace said. You would just use it for criminal purposes. She removed the lock from the hasp and pushed the trap door open. Marty shined the headlamp up through the opening, but did not start up the short ladder to the sky house. What are you waiting for, Grace asked. I'm not thrilled about sticking my head through a dark hole until I have a better idea of what's inside. He grabbed his cap away from Bo and tossed it through the trap door. Bo hooted, grabbed PD, and scrambled up the ladder. That was mean, Grace said. Marty grinned. Yeah. There was a dull thumping above them. Then Bo stuck her head through the opening, wearing the cap. Coast is clear. Grace followed him up the short ladder. Whoa, Marty said. What's that smell? Grace asked. Marty shined the headlamp on the ceiling. Dozens of upside-down bats stared back at them. He pointed to the wooden floor. Bat guano, he said. Better watch where you... Something slithered just to the left of the beam. Snake! P.D. jumped into his pocket as he drew the machete and buried the blade behind the snake's head, removing it cleanly in one fluid motion. Gray screamed as the heavy body flopped around her feet, which upset the bats. They dropped from their roost and started a panicky flap around the dark room, which upset Bo. She, she jumped up to the back of an old overstuffed sofa and started batting bats out of the air, which upset P.D., she jumped out of Marty's pocket and started attacking the stunned bats. Stop! Marty shouted. Gray stopped screaming, Bo stopped swatting, and PD stopped snapping. The bats continued swooping, but not for long. Most of them found the open trap door and disappeared into the rainy night, and the others returned to their roost. I'll figure out what to do with the rest of the bats tomorrow, Marty said. I'm worried about snakes, Grace said. What kind was it? A green mamba. Venomous? Marty bent over and looked at the headless body, which had finally stopped writhing. Not anymore. There might be others. I'll take a look around as soon as we get some light, some more light in here. A tremendous gust of wind rocked the house, and the twins grabbed each other to stop themselves from falling, da falling down. It's like being on a ship during a storm. How many sea storms have you experienced? Grace asked. Plenty, Marty said, although he had never been to sea. I started looking for something to light the house. He found a kerosene lamp. Now all we need is a match. Unfortunately, you left them in the other pack, Grace finished for him. She opened a drawer and pulled out a mason jar filled with matches. Perhaps one of these work will work? Marty was too tired to ask how she might have known that matches were in that particular drawer. He stuffed a handful into his pocket, lit the lamp, and began his search for deadly snakes. The tree house was about 40 by 40 feet. A kitchen took up half of one wall and was equipped with a propane oven and a sink. Marty turned on a tap and watched brown ooze dribble from the faucet. Don't drink the water, he said, and started opening cupboards. He found no snakes, but he did find canned goods, sugar, flour, rice, and various spices, all sealed tight in mason jars. We won't starve. Running along the rest of the wall was a laboratory bench, similar to the one in Wolf's library, with a microscope, beakers, and test tubes. Next to the bench was a wall of books, most of which had been ruined by humidity. 
At the far end of the bookshelf was a door with an odd whistling sound coming from behind it. What do you think that is? Marty asked. I have no idea, Grace answered. But I think we should wait until tomorrow to find out. Marty was ready to agree, but knew the sound would drive him crazy until he found out what it was. With his machete raised, he opened the door slowly and discovered a white toilet. He flipped the lid open with his foot and the whistling stopped. The bowl was empty except for the wind coming up through the hole. Musical to toilet, he said. I'm not sitting on that, Grace said. Ever. Marty kept the headlamp beam on the toilet. What are you doing? Grace asked. Wondering why Wolf would need a private toilet. Modesty? Grace said. Marty shook his head. If you're alone, there's no call for modesty, which means Wolf wasn't here alone. Who was with him? Ted Bronson? No way, Marty said. Ted's a total recluse. He never leaves the island. It wasn't Ted. Next time we talk to Wolf, we'll ask, Grace said. In the meantime, let's continue the snake search. Marty closed the door. Along the last wall were more shelves filled with supplies. At the far end of the shelves was a ladder leading up to a second trap door. We'll leave that till tomorrow, Marty said. He was exhausted. In the center of the room was a sofa and two chairs with a table between them. He checked under all the cushions, pronounced the room snake free and plopped down on the sofa. Grace glared at him. Excuse me? Marty had already closed his eyes. What? Where am I supposed to sleep? The chairs look pretty comfortable to me. You can push them together. Some night you are. Marty sighed and got up and helped her with the chairs. Grace was tired as well, but too stirred up to sleep. She found a couple of blankets on the shelf, one for Marty and one for herself, then got her moleskin out of her father's backpack and began to write.